I'm going to bring us back, uh, back from Antarctica, uh, back, to, back to our uh, backyard. And I'm going to talk about two time series, an old one and a new one, uh, both here on the eastern seaboard. Okay, so you know this, but uh, it's worth reiterating. So this is a historic seashore. It's been occupied by people for a very long time. Uh, and the marine resources and transportation infrastructure that the, that the marine environment provides have really sustained coastal communities for long time periods. But of course, the climate is changing. And one of the questions that we have is then how is the ecosystem changing? In, in response to this. And what I'm going to talk about today is how we're looking towards the base of the food web um, to understand how changes at the base of the food web are influencing the marine environment uh, from aspects like fish, harmful algal blooms, uh, and then also uh, large marine mammals. Okay, so I'm going to go down to the microbes, uh, but hopefully it'll be interesting uh, to you. So, so what is the base of the food web? The base of the food web are the plankton. And they're important, of course, because they generate the organic matter that fuels uh, the marine ecosystem. So we have these primary producers. These are microscopic organisms. Uh, there are, eat, they're eaten by herbivorous consumers, also known as zooplankton. You saw uh, Hugh flashed up some pictures of krill very briefly at the end, so they would fit in this category. And then uh, they're eaten by fish. So understanding fluctuations here um, and how that energy flows through the food web can really help us understand um, how some of the marine resources we're most interested in might respond to climate change. One of the things I wanted to talk about here are some of the ecosystem services that um, phytoplankton provide for us. So here we have another view of that food web here uh, with nutrients fueling the microscopic phytoplankton into the zooplankton and then to the fish. Uh, and of course, the phytoplankton feed all of the fish we eat and also the ones that we don't eat. Okay, so it's important. Uh, and just in Rhode Island alone, um, commercial and recreational fishing supports thousands of jobs and hundreds of millions of dollars of uh, sales. Okay, so Rhode Island is really uh, dependent on Narragansett Bay for a good part of its employment and income. Uh, and in Massachusetts along the coast as well. And Maine for sure. Uh, these phytoplankton generate half of the oxygen that we breathe. So as you're sitting here respiring, uh, every other breath you take is generated by these organisms. So small, but with a giant impact on all life on Earth. Is that right? Yes, yeah, so even if you, your relatives live in Kansas, the oxygen that they're breathing generated by phytoplankton, okay? So, across the atmosphere. Uh, they also uh, incorporate and, and their sinking acts to bury uh, much of the excess anthropogenic carbon uh, that we produce, right? So we're seeing a signal in the atmosphere of increased CO2. If the phytoplankton weren't around, that signal would be even larger. So I'm going to switch now from these ecosystem services to thinking about long-term time series and go over some of the questions that we're asking with these. And I'm going to start first with the new time series. And this is the Northeast Shelf LTR. Uh, and it was started in 2017. Okay, so that's in, in contrast uh, to the other LTRs you've heard about earlier in the talk. Uh, it's led uh, by my colleagues at Woods Hole, and we have PIs from Wellesley, UMass, and the University of Rhode Island. And we also have a NOAA uh, Fisheries as a partner. And one of the exciting things about this, air, this time series is it takes into account an area that uh, borders, uh, that's with the border of, of Canada, all the way through down um, to North Carolina, to Cape Hatteras. And that's this northeast shelf. And the shelf is the area uh, that's uh, fairly shallow, uh, up to a few hundred meters before we reach this drop off into the deep ocean where we get into depths of thousands of meters. This Northeast shelf, of course, is important. It's home to 30% of the US population, okay? So uh, it generates revenue from fishing, energy, tourism, um, and we also utilize it uh, for shipping, waste disposal, and conservation. So really, really important to the U.S. Um, population in terms of some of the ecosystem services that we rely on 
Uh, this picture just shows the Endeavor. That's one of the ships we take out. And this also, I put this up to, to point out that we're taking into account different kinds of assets that are out in the water. So we have buoyed assets that are part of an uh, ocean observing uh, system. We have uh, autonomous vehicles that are moving around collecting data. And we have cabled towers that are near shore. So basically, while I'm speaking, there's data being collected. Okay, so we get continuous measurements in addition to ship-based measurements uh, that we go out uh, multiple times a year for. So the questions that we're asking of this time series are really basic, um, but they're really difficult to answer unless you have the sustained long-term data. And of course, this has been mentioned in the previous two talks, right? You really need some of these long-term data sets to really answer questions about the ecosystem because of the variability in that, in that ecosystem. So in this LTR, we have three um, main areas that we're focused on. One is the base of the food web. Okay? So what controls the patterns of plankton species composition and primary productivity? In terms of fish, um, how is this variability that we see in the feeding and the distribution of fish linked to the variability at the base of the food web? So making that connection. And in fact, as an aside, uh, oceanography really started out as an attempt to understand that connection between the base of the food web and fish productivity. Um, and here we are today, we're still really trying to figure it out. It's complex, uh, a complex question and it's difficult to, to work out. Uh, and then of course, the response to environmental change. So how is that vulnerability and resilience of this Northeast Shelf ecosystem, and of course it's ecosystem services, uh, how vulnerable is it to climate induced environmental changes? Okay, so I've told you about this vast swath of the shelf, this rich fisheries area, lots of um, transportation through here. I'm going to focus in on uh, one area, which is uh, in Narragansett Bay, to talk about the old time series. And that's the Narragansett Bay long-term plankton time series uh, that I'm fortunate enough to be the director of. Uh, this is the Narragansett Bay watershed. Uh, and here we are up in Boston. And what I want to point out is that while much of Narragansett Bay is in Rhode Island, part of it is uh, in Massachusetts, and a good part of the watershed is in Massachusetts. Okay? Uh, so it's important when we think about watershed management. So we sample weekly. Uh, that's been done since the late 1950s. And I want to point out that I'm not extraordinarily well preserved. Uh, I am <laughs> not the, the founding director of that. That was uh, founded by Professor Ted Smeda, uh, who unfortunately recently passed away. Uh, and uh, then I'm, I'm actually the third director in line uh, for this time series. And it's the longest record of its kind anywhere on Earth. Uh, and we take physical, chemical, and biological data. And uh, this is my graduate student, Stephanie Anderson, taking samples. And she's here today, so if you want to talk to her about what it's like to do the boots on the ground work of this weekly time series, um, she's going to be here for you to talk to you at lunchtime. So what do we see in terms of climate change in Narragansett Bay? Uh, so this is a data record from, the, from 1960 up through um, 2012 or 2010. And we see that surface uh, water temperatures have increased by over about two and a half degrees in the last 50 years. Um, and this is the annual average temperature. And the last uh, data slide I want to show you, actually, I'm going to go back for a minute and talk about this this time series. So this time series of temperature we've had in hand for quite some time. Uh, but we haven't actually had the biological data in hand. Um, I only just received the long-term biological data uh, several months ago when my, uh, the former director passed away. Okay. So for the first time, this data is now available to analyze, going back to the late 1950s. So the next slide I'm going to show you is really some of the first data hot off the press. I have a class that's working on this data, uh, and they're a graduate class, uh, and they are getting to work with this long-term time series in a way that some of my colleagues are like, could I, could I take your class? I, I'd like to look at that. Um, so you're going to see some data. It's hot off the press. A graduate student sent it to me late last night uh, as they're preparing for their final presentations of the, of the semester. Um, so I, I want to point that out because it, it really is the very beginning of this analysis, partly because the data has not been available. And in some cases, we're going back into paper records from, from the 1960s. Uh, and so what we're finding is that in the plankton, there are both winners and losers. Uh, and I'll show you a couple trends here. 
what you see on that x-axis is year. It's very small. I'm sorry. I didn't have a chance to edit what the student sent me. This is from 1960 to 2020. And this is the persistence in the number of weeks per year that any, kind, any one species is present. So if it's present all year long, it's up, up here. If it's present very infrequently here. What we're seeing is that uh, some species appear to have been very stable for long time periods. And there's perhaps a step change in terms of their persistence in the ecosystem. Uh, there are others that look to be increasing, uh, although you can see <laughs> some huge uh, swings in the, uh, the persistence. And then there are others that appear to be leaving the ecosystem. And in this one, I want to point out that the student, he only uh, plotted it up to 2002. I'm thinking it wasn't worth plotting out to here because it's no longer in the ecosystem. So this graph actually goes out to about here. And since here, this particular organism has not been present in Narragansett Bay. Okay, so why do we care about this? Um, these uh, plankton that, that we're looking at uh, form harmful algal blooms. Okay, so that's toxic to humans. It can have great economic impact. And some of the plankton I'm looking at here are really key uh, pieces of the food web in terms of feeding the rich fishery in the estuary. Okay, so these are the winners and losers are also the good and the bad and how they line up can have a big influence on, on, human ecosystem, on humans. Okay, and then the last slide I have is just to say, so to reiterate that the research we're doing really does, or we think has you know, great societal benefits. Uh, and the answers to some of these really basic questions in all of these LTRs that, that we've been discussing, uh, we hope will influence policy decision as well as ecosystem management. And I've put some of the pictures up here of uh, some of the players in these two time series. And I ask you to stay tuned because we're gonna have some exciting data coming out of that uh, Narragansett Bay time series. And we're gonna start, or we are starting to collect for the Northeast Shelf. Thank you.